participants. Uh, I'm Jay Shranjan, as has been introduced. I'm a part of the government here in uh, Telangana in Hyderabad. I look after the portfolios of uh, information technology and industries. And uh, I'll be sharing my thoughts on blockchain. Many of you may feel that this is a very esoteric topic. Typically topics in uh, TEDx are chosen, keeping in mind what is the larger public interest. And many of you may feel that this is something really out of the way. But as you listen to me, hopefully you will realize that there is something in blockchain which can potentially impact our lives in multiple ways. And that will be my goal to really convince you about this technology, the utility of this technology. So uh, in the last uh, few months, and particularly in the last one month, one and a half months or so, we have been seeing a very interesting debate uh, raging in the newspapers and media in India today about uh, cryptocurrencies. In fact, uh, many of you would be aware now that a new bill is going to be introduced in the parliament anytime soon since the winter session is on, which will be giving lots of uh, directions about how the country wants to engage with uh, cryptocurrency. We know that uh, those of us who have been reading about this debate or following this debate uh, regularly, will also know that uh, Reserve Bank of India, the federal bank here, has a very strong position about uh, cryptocurrencies. In fact, they want a complete ban on cryptocurrency. In fact, uh, if you ask anyone, uh, or, or particular in, particularly an economist or someone from a regulatory perspective, their view will be that the value of a currency, in fact, one of the basic character of a currency should be stability. And obviously cryptos, as we have seen uh, ourselves, they fluctuate like anything. We read uh, occasionally on how the new heights that uh, a, crypto, a particular cryptocurrency has achieved. And then suddenly we realize on one day that it has fallen down and it has eroded uh, uh, millions of dollars of wealth of people who had invested. So obviously that's a very unstable kind of a thing. It's like gambling. So. Obviously, that is RBI's view that we can't have a currency which has so much of fluctuation. There's no stability. It is like gambling. But we also know that there are a large number of people who are uh, quite uh, forceful in arguing that cryptocurrencies are the currencies of the future. And uh, obviously, banning is a very, very extreme kind of step. And uh, just like any other currency, this also should be allowed to freely trade, etc. So there are uh, multiple views about it. And uh, of course, what is the final view of the government of India will only be known when the bill is actually introduced. Unlike many other uh, pieces of legislation, which are typically put up for public discussion, for consultation, etc. Not much is known about uh, this particular bill till it is uh, eventually uh, introduced in the floor of the parliament. But from whatever limited interviews, et cetera, which Honorable Finance Minister and other senior officials have given, the intent seems to be obviously not to ban it, but to regulate it. And the logic which is given is that banning is, of course, a very extreme form. And if you ban it completely, you, lo you lose out on the merits of technology, on the values of innovation, et cetera, et cetera. So seems to be a nuanced approach, but let us wait till uh, we finally see the fine print on, uh, on, uh, on the table of the house. Now, what is this technology? And this is where the interesting bits about blockchain comes into being. So blockchain is a very innovative uh, distributed ledger technology, which was actually first introduced in the design and development of cryptocurrency, specifically a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin in Japan by a person called Satoshi Nakamoto. So uh, this is the key link between uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain. That blockchain is something which is the fundamental or the base technology behind these kind of uh, currencies. And if I may add so, see the reason why blockchain was found to be a very appropriate technology is that as one can make out, cryptocurrencies are digital assets and they will be traded digitally. And therefore, the way conventionally records are kept of uh, financial transactions, they are very dissimilar to what will it be needed if you have to keep a record of digital transactions. So blockchain basically, as I said, is a distributed ledger which acts as a single source of truth. So 
it eliminates the need for having a central entity to validate the transaction. Basically, many parties can access the ledger at the same time. And uh, the most be important benefit of this technology is that the information which is recorded on a block, it cannot be changed. It is literally impossible to change it without agreement from all the parties involved. So every new record becomes a block with a unique identifying hash and linking the blocks into a chain of records forms that blockchain. So as I explained, this helps in uh, traceability, it helps in maintaining transparency, it is immutable and therefore certain uh, key requirements when there are millions of users who are all spread across, they don't really uh, know who each other is and sometimes there may be even a lack of trust or a trust deficit amongst them. So these are some of the important uh, factors which promote the usage of a technology like blockchain. So it also helps in uh, lots of auditing, record keeping. Suppose you want to check a trail of transactions and if the record is maintained on a blockchain, it is very easy to do so. So there are multiple uh, platforms today that have been created, which all essentially utilize blockchain. So distributed ledger technology, DLT, which is also popularly called as Hyperledger. That is one good example. But there is another one which is also becoming very popular, which is called Ethereum. And there are quite a few others as well. So there are multiple platforms today with which you can operate blockchain. But as I was mentioning, while it all began with cryptocurrencies, the usage of blockchain has gone much beyond cryptocurrencies. And today in the government also, more than anyone else, there's tremendous amount of excitement and enthusiasm in utilizing blockchain in multiple contexts that is very, very visible. And I can share about my own government, my own state of Telangana, where we are considered as one of the pioneers in having utilized blockchain uh, enabled technologies in at least 15 different domains. And there are many other states also. I won't say that Telangana is the only state. I mean, just to give an example, lots of good work has happened in Tamil Nadu. Some interesting work has happened in Karnataka some uh, work in uh, Andhra Pradesh and even at the national government's level, there are certain projects of national importance which are being driven by blockchain. So blockchain's uh, utility, as I am repeatedly mentioning, has moved beyond cryptocurrency. So tomorrow, whether cryptocurrencies are banned or allowed to remain or regulated in some form, no one can deny that blockchain has introduced a whole new way of looking at certain contexts and making them more manageable more uh, easy to administer because of certain inherent features of that technology. And uh, when I speak about a couple of use cases which we have uh, run in the state of Telangana, you will also appreciate how this technology can really be of a larger benefit to all the stakeholders. So without much uh, ado, let me speak about the first use case, which in my opinion is also very defining, very, very important for the country as a whole. And uh, incidentally, this particular use case has been tried out just about a month ago. So this is extremely topical, extremely recent uh, in our experience. See, many of us uh, have been debating about this, thinking about it, occasionally lamenting about it, about the non-representative way our elections are conducted. In fact, many of us know that uh, in the urban areas in particular, there is, an, there is a prevailing uh, apathy of voters. The voter turnout is very less, sometimes as low as 30%, 40%. But because we have the first past the post kind of a system in our, in our elections, so within that 40% also, whoever get, gets larger number of votes, he becomes the representative. And obviously if someone is representing, let us say only 15%, 16% of the voters, and claims to become their member or their representative. Obviously, this is not a very representational democracy. And uh, various reasons are cited. Why is there this apathy? But one of the most common reasons, if, for instance, I, in my career, have administered multiple elections. And uh, if you talk to urban voters in particular, the inconvenience of uh, going to a voting station, first of all, even finding where your voting station is, and uh, then kind of going there and, you know, being a part of a crowd and it's all very inconvenient, uh, so to say. So the sheer uh, reason of inconvenience and obviously the feeling that if I don't vote, 
what will happen hundreds of others are still going and voting and so on and so forth so multiple reasons are there but convenience or lack of convenience is an important reason so and uh, obviously in the last two years in particular since we are in the middle of a pandemic where uh, maintaining uh, uh, social distance is very important not getting into crowded places is very important and uh, in this context even uh, people who are otherwise responsible would like to make their contribution to participatory democracy even they have shied away from participating in the voting process so lots of thinking is going on at at the national level in the in a couple of states whether there is a possibility of doing remote voting like you sit at home you remain at home and using a device obviously a smartphone you ca you cast your votes and uh, let me tell you that uh, this practice is already being followed in uh, one particular country called uh, Estonia Estonia is in uh, Europe it is very close to nord nordic uh, nations and is considered to be one of the most uh, digitally advanced countries in the world so they have introduced uh, digital voting electronic voting or home based voting or remote voting whatever you call many many years ago and that experiment has been quite successful so uh, looking at the possibilities and obviously the prevailing circumstances of this uh, pandemic induced uh, restrictions in telangana we also did a demonstration of remote voting in a town called khambam which is uh, roughly around uh, 300 kilometers from hyderabad we in the khambam town uh, municipal areas we tried out a demonstration of uh, uh, electronic voting with uh, roughly around 4000 voters 3880 voters to be precise this was done just a month ago and uh, obviously one of the more important stakeholders in the entire electoral process are the political parties and typically if you tell them that i'm now going to introduce a system where people can sit at home and they can vote lots of uh, uh, alerts will be raised in their minds what what kind of misuse is possible how can someone uh, prevent impersonation for example if i am claiming to be sitting at my home and voting using a phone uh is it not possible that someone impersonates me and casts maybe 20 votes uh using uh, that mobile phone so obviously we have found answers to all of these and uh, there are again very sophisticated elements of technology that have been introduced but one of the other key questions or doubts or apprehensions that come in the minds of the political parties is how will you keep the vote secure see as uh, many of you would know even now when we use uh, electronic voting machines doubts are being cast i mean it is kind of funny that typically a party which loses the election always blames the evm that evms were rigged votes were manipulated whatever button i was pressing all the votes were being uh, you know cast on a particular uh, symbol or a particular candidate so when they have so much of doubts even on a robust system like the electronic voting machines why how can we prevent that they have no doubts about this remote voting through a device so in our demonstration we tried blockchain and we ensured that every vote which is cast as i told you 3880 people participated in that demo and whoever casted their vote that vote was time stamped a particular unique hash was given and it was stored on a blockchain and in the demonstration and after the demonstration we were able to show that no one can tamper with that particular sequence of voting so if let us say 1000 people vote in a particular polling station every vote and even if four people are voting simultaneously because different people are in different homes different locations they won't know who is voting now who is going to vote later and they may be trying it out simultaneously with someone else also even those kind of ways you can have a split set second kind of a difference do the time stamping have a create a very unique uh, hash and uh, store the whole thing on a blockchain and uh, encrypt it and at the time of counting it can be decrypted by an authorized person the votes can be tallied and uh, results come out in a jiffy so this is one very good way tomorrow if the whole country if consensus is built around electronic voting everyone agrees to this particular methodology this will be a great use of uh, how blockchain has been able to solve one of the biggest uh, kind of uh, requirements in our country i'll very quickly move on to the next uh, use case as well again this is a use case while the first use case <coughs> that i spoke about has is still at a demonstration stage we have just tried it out with close to 4000 voters 
The second use case that I'm speaking about now has been scaled up for the entire state. And again, this is a big issue in uh, many states of our country. And I presume since the talk is being hosted in Calcutta, it is a very pressing issue in Bengal as well. This is about uh, cheat funds. Many of you would know that in India, this uh, cheat funds uh, exist through which large number of subscribers pool an amount of money, subscribe uh, by paying regularly. And at the end of the cheat cycle, uh, the money is pooled, someone is declared the winner, the money is passed on to them, and so on and so forth. So large number of people participate in cheat funds. They have been here historically. And uh, we also know intuitively that lots of the let us say the working class people, the bottom of the pyramid people, they participate in larger numbers in cheat fund because for them, it's an opportunity sometimes to make uh, easy money, sometimes even uh, life-changing kind of amounts are won by people. So that motivates them to be a part of cheat fund. Cheat funds are also legal, unlike lotteries or other forms of betting, which are semi-legal or not completely legal at all in some states. Cheat funds have acts but we also know that this whole landscape of cheat fund is uh, littered with scams. Again, I don't want to point to any particular state or any particular region, but we know of certain states where the scam has assumed a massive proportion and uh, has even threatened the stability of the government in some cases. But regardless of that, there are lots of instances of frauds, of manipulations in this entire cheat fund business. So in uh, our state of Telangana, with the help of a startup, we created a blockchain-based solution, which is called T-Chit. And uh, essentially what it does is that it brings lots of order into this messy chit fund system. So every person, every subscriber, <coughs> whenever he or she makes a payment, a ticket it is raised on the block and the entire transaction till the person makes another transaction a third transaction or receives a prize, the prize is delivered. All the transactions are recorded on that particular block. And uh, now that this uh, exercise is going on in Telangana for the last uh, more than two years, I can tell you that it has brought in a tremendous amount of orderliness into this entire business. The entire administration today can monitor who may, how many people are subscribed, how many people are participating, who has won, how much prize money is delivered. And uh, it has brought in a whole new level of transparency. And also in the user groups, which is the, as I said, the working class people, the bottom of the pyramid people, trust in that system has gone up manifold. And this again, we have found is a great example of bringing in some order and discipline into a very chaotic system. So there are many such examples. We know that in many states, land records are used, are stabilized using blockchains, educational certificates, degree certificates are stored using blockchain. In Telangana, we have also started using blockchain for traceability purposes. So for example, uh, vaccines are currently the flavor of the day. To ensure that there are no fake vaccines in the system, we trace every vaccine uh, using, using blockchain. Seeds are getting traced using blockchain. And uh, we also have applied blockchain in uh, the in uh, tracing vehicles. As you know, every vehicle has a life cycle from the time it is uh, released from the factory till the time uh, it uh, comes to the dealer, to the first buyer, sometimes to the second buyer, third buyer, the entire chain of that transaction is recorded. So multiple innovative uses of blockchain and uh, this kind of uh, uh, innovation is multiplying in our country day by day by day. So as I said in the beginning, while it would have it could have started in a very limited way to support cryptocurrencies, today it has moved much beyond cryptocurrencies. Lots of innovative uses have come. And tomorrow, I'm very confident that not just for governments, for enterprises, for large companies, for startups, this will be found to be a very robust technology, a very useful technology. And uh, there'll be many takers of that technology. So I once again uh, thank uh, organizers of TEDx, I am Cal for giving me this opportunity.